We're continuing the fifth chapter of Ephesians tonight. We'll be in verses uh, 11 through 13. Now, my understanding, if there's something that has not dawned on the professed Christian community, it's the fact that we're engaged in a warfare. This, gen this general knowledge, it appears to me, is at a very low level. We are in an intense battle Amen. with sin, with the devil, with the world, and with what is called the law of sin and death, which is in our members. So it's a severe test. And often a lot of people never even, don't even know this. Yeah. It has not really been declared. So in your personal prayers, this is one thing you want to ask the Lord to raise up messengers that will let this be made known to the people. Most people are unaware that we're of the fight of faith, a good fight. It is a fight. The good fight of faith. And this is owing to the fact that a strange Jesus and gospel have been preached. That this doesn't seem to be the conclusion people arrive at. When they hear all the preaching and they participate in all the programs and attend all the gatherings, they are not coming up with this conclusion. To fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Now, we don't have to ask what are they being preached. We know what's not being preached because that is the consequence of true preaching is that people become keenly aware of the fact that they're engaged in a battle. And any time there's a battle, there's jeopardy. It's always a jeopardy when there's battle. Now, I know we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, but that factor in Christ Jesus, that's, that's, a, bad, that's a big qualification. Now, you remember some of the first words that Peter said to those who cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? <clears throat> he did it with many other words. Acts 2.40 says, with many other words. He exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now, people, there are a lot of people that have never heard those words. Nobody has ever told them. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Untoward generation is a generation going the wrong direction. It's not going the right place. See, a lot of people have never been told this, brethren. That one of the first things Peter knew, right? The first proclamation of an exalted Christ, he knew this thing's got to come across. You've got to save yourself from this untoward generation. And that was a generation that was sitting in the audience of devout Jews. Yeah. Yes. Amen. We're not talking about bar flies and things like that mm. and whoremongers. Mm. This was a generation of devout Jews yeah. from every nation under heaven. But they were like a remnant among a degenerate religious society. Yeah. This message wasn't preached in Rome. This is preached in Jerusalem, the city of God, where he placed his name among a people that had been cultured for hundreds of years to think right about the Messiah. Now you can imagine if those words were spoken to them, what kind of words you suppose are addressed to our generation? It's a very arresting thing to think about. <coughs> Traveled for weeks and yes. spent a huge number amount of money yes, that's to right. travel and be there be in right. Jerusalem during that time. Some had stayed there for weeks. That's right. And every day. great cost. They were and, devout that's people. That's right. Devout people. Mm -hmm. And they were but they were surrounded by a generation. Jesus said, What, what am I going to liken this generation to? Yeah. They're like people that sit on the sidelines and toot their flutes and get angry if you don't dance their tune. Yeah. That's what he said. 
Save yourself from this untoward generation. Now Paul's accenting in this text we're in, he's accenting this fight. And he's, he's telling you some things that you can't, under no circumstances, can you allow them to arise in your life. Not by mistake, not by momentary error. They just can't. That's all there is to it. And for the, to stop them from rising, you're going to have to fight. You have to resist. You're going to have to wrestle and cast down high thoughts. See, you're going to have to do this, and this is the thing he's, he's talking about. <coughs> when any generation is untoward, <coughs> it's been preceded by something that's kicked this thing off. Now, with Israel, I believe it was Rehoboam is the one that it kind of commenced with who established the different idols in different parts of the country, was it Jeroboam? Jeroboam. And because of Jeroboam and the decline, see, he said it's too far to, too far to go to Jerusalem, so we'll, yes. we'll make it convenient for everybody. We'll situate a golden calf at the northern part, a northern calf at the southern part. And that began this slide downward. In fact, that several places it says that God judged Israel because of the sins of Jeroboam. Yes. Now, in, in our society, not in our society, in a preceding society, the, the Dark Ages was preceded by something like that. There, the Dark Ages was a tremendous spiritual decline where even the Word of God, hardly anybody in the world knew what the Word of God said. It was hidden away in monasteries and just a few people knew anything about it. But it was preceded, see? by a period of time that defiled a whole generation. Then in our generation, you had the Enlightenment, Age of Reason, where the 1800s, that, where God was excommunicated from France and England. He was kicked out. God was. It was a reaction against Catholicism, but it was it was still wrong, and they kicked him out and vaunted human reasoning, and with that began biblical higher criticism, they call it, and all kind of things started a different different way of thinking. We're in the aftermath yes. yeah. of that of that Amen. fault, and we're in a generation that's like the generation that Jesus preached to. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's all kind of people now trying to get us to feel sorry for this generation. This is not the right attitude. The right attitude is get out of this and take as many people out as you can. Yes. That should be the, see, that should be, yeah, everybody knows that this generation is this kind of generation. Says that some people haven't articulated it and said it, but everyone is, that I know, that has any kind of understanding at all about God is stricken with the fact that so little is known about the truth of this yeah. generation. Amen. All right, that's the kind of generation where we've got to save ourselves from that generation. The Ephesians, they were in a sensual society. Their religion was sensual. They had harlots in their temples. This is how they worshiped God. Their God. That's the kind of society they were in. So he's, this thing, this stuff can leak into the body of Christ if they're not alert. So that's why he's talking the way he's, he's talking. Before the end of that century, Jesus had to send a letter to the church where they had a woman in the church who was right. teaching the disciples to <laughs> engage in the very things that's that many in Ephesus That's was right. Doing. That's exactly right. Yeah. So a tremendous Thanks. decline had taken place. And, Paul is precipitating the decline by like a trumpet, trumpet sound. Now there's a sense in which corrupt religion has caused all of this, whether it was the first decline that led to the Dark Ages, whether it was a decline that led, followed the Age of Reason. It was, it was preceded by a religious decline, which actually caused the moral decline. That's why Babylon the Great is named the way she is. Here it is in Revelation 17, 5. 
and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. It's hard to, hard to understand it. Babylon the Great, tremendous power. The mother of harlots. And, not only is she the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. Amen. Oh, that's a key. Yes, you see why is society the way it is? It's the church's fault. Amen. Professed church. Make no mistake about this now. People have got to see this. Because the body of Christ is a pillar and ground of the truth. Its function is to hold the truth up so it's hard to sin. So people are made aware, as soon as they find out, they're made aware yeah, of the wrongness of something. But the church has been recalcitrant. It, it says Babylon. Babylon has done this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it had already started in Paul's day. It had already started. There were some people who were opposing Paul right out. Yeah. And it already started. So he is alerting the church to this condition. And they got to not pay attention to the way things are going. Religious, religious trends and new ideas and new religious thoughts. They've got to stop paying attention to that kind of stuff because it's, it's an open door where wrong things are were coming in. All right, now I, with that in mind, here's what he says in verses 11 to 13. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things are reproved that are reproved are made manifest by the light, and whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Now again in the uh, religious mindset that exists, Words like this make no sense. <laughs> you read this to the average church, but they just like a big question mark. What is he talking about? It, it doesn't make sense. But here's how the things of God work. If when you hear the things of God, they don't make sense, your job isn't to figure them out. It's to, you keep these things, keep rehearsing them in your mind, keep repeating them in your mind, because the, the Word of God itself is powerful sharper than a two-edged sword, even to divide us under soul and spirit. There's a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So as you, as you keep these things in mind, don't, don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. If you don't understand what that means, say it to yourself again. Pray it to, to God. Think of it a lot. Let that word work in you. Let it dwell in you richly. Yeah. Amen. And then that opens, that begins to open the thing up. <laughs> Now here's another statement that might be con construed as negative. And there's been a lot of these kind of statements in the book of Ephesians. Things that sound to what the world says is negative. I'll give you a few of them. Walk not as other Gentiles. These are all in Ephesians up to this point. Sin not. Let not the sin go down in your wrath. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. Let it not once be named among you. Neither give place to the devil. Steal no more. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Neither filthiness or foolish talking nor jesting. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Not, be not partaker with them. See, it sounds like a lot of negativity. But these things are spoken for our protection. Because our adversary is subtle. When he brings delusion in, he doesn't hold up a sign and say, this is a delusion. That's right. But you'd think he did, by the way some people think, the way they speak. So Paul will not allow people to think in this manner. He'll keep hammering on these things, even though they may not have been doing these things. There was one sin that some were doing. Let him that stole steal no more. But the rest of these, they may not have been doing it. But see that... That doesn't mean Satan has ceased to tempt people to do them. Sometimes he'll use people close to you to tempt you to do it. So he's going to admonish them because he knows that Christ died to deliver us from this present evil world. 
So how likely is it that God will allow those he has delivered from the world to become enmeshed with the world? How, how likely is that? See, once you see it, it doesn't, it, you see it, it cannot be true. Have no fellowship. Other versions read like this. Do not participate in. Have nothing to do with, that's the NIV. Take no part in, that's revised standard. Have no company with, that's the basic Bible. Don't share in. That's the New English. Stop having anything to do with the Williams Bible. Don't waste your time on it. It's a message Bible. See, there's, such, there's a whole category of things that you just can't have anything to do with. That's just the way it is. Now, he has revealed the destiny of people who do these things. So this is said in view of the destiny of those who do such things. He said, don't let any man deceive you now. For because of these things, see, because of these things, comes the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. So it doesn't make any difference if you are a member of the first church or the first church there. You think that makes any difference? If God said wrath's coming on people to do these things, it doesn't make any difference what they said. Doesn't make any difference what their fault God or their family may be. He's going to come down with wrath on people that do this. Paul is convinced of this. You won't hear Paul saying, listen, no matter what you do, God will still love you and receive you. He'll not leave people with that impression. He'll tell you, look, let me, don't forget. These things I said not to do. It's just not that we got a list of rules. This is the rules of our particular denomination and that you can't do it because of that. No, you can't do it because God's going to damn people let go. Yes. Well, I tell you, that's straightforward. I can remember when that kind of language like woke me up. Don't, don't make any mistake about that. Those who participate in the manner of life live in an ungodly manner. Those who participate with people like that will participate in their destiny. You wonder why he said don't be unequally yoked? You wonder why he said that? I understand there's some people that are caught in the trap that it wasn't intentional. At one time they both were, both people were out and one was converted and one wasn't. Paul tells you how to deal with it. If, if the uh, person is unbeliever, it can dwell peaceably. That means they don't tell you not to go to church. And they don't tell you not to read the Bible. And they, if they dwell peaceably, if they can't, you're not under any obligation to stay with them. That's what he said, 1 Corinthians 7, I believe it. Amen. I know someone said, well, yeah, but they got, can't stay, they can't be married. No, he said you're under, not under bondage in such a case. The tie has been severed. Amen. There's another thing, that's, that's one thing that severs the tie. Another thing is adultery severs the tie. Even God puts away people who commit adultery against him. I'm just, I say these things to just to accent the seriousness, the seriousness of it because we're living in a society, the older people here, they, they know this, but some of the younger people, they're accustomed to things being said and done by maybe some of their peers that don't know this and they speak too freely about sin and you can see it on the media. You, you can see things like this that you forget that God's going to bring wrath on people to do this. Even if they're a multi-million dollar movie star, he's still going to do it. So he's, uh, don't participate with them. Don't link up with them. A person has to work this out themselves. I, I, I'll just tell you how I worked it out. I refuse to be part of a project where there's one of these kind of people in it. I don't care if it's a philanthropic project. I don't care what it is. I will not be linked up with it. Now, if a person has to decide for themselves, I can't legislate in the matter. I have trouble enough with <laughs> working out my own salvation. But every person has to be that serious about it. 
They have to review before God, review their associations. Their associations were, are associations that, that aren't necessary, but you maintain them anyway. There's some associations we understand. If you're a servant and you work for a bad boss, well, God doesn't say don't obey him. He doesn't say that. Yeah. So there's some associations you can't like. Mm -hmm. Just absolve them. These are where you have a, yeah. have a choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. Don't join yourself with them. Have no fellowship with them. Don't participate with them. Right. And he refers to their activities as unfruitful works. It's an intriguing statement. Unfruitful works. Normally you think people are unfruitful, see? Normally you think of people being unfruitful, but here's works. Unfruitful works. Other versions read fruitless deeds of darkness or useless works or futile works or barren unprofitable deeds or profitless doings and worthless things. See, unfruitful means without fruit or barren. That'd be a good word. It just doesn't mean they don't have fruit because there's not time to have fruit. They can have fruit, but they don't now know. Fruit, unfruitful works means the works cannot produce fruit. They are works that cannot be productive as God counts productivity. They don't have a capacity to produce. They're like a barren woman. See? There are works like this. It's, you can't clean them up. <laughs> No matter what you do, you can't like maybe have a prayer meeting before them or whatever. You can't. They're unfruitful works. God had there are certain kind of things that that will take from you. They'll never give to you. Now I've lived long enough that I could identify some of these things that I confronted in my life, and they were, some of them did rob me. But you have to you have to work this out. That's why he's writing this so that people can work this work this out. <coughs> So they're incapable. The unfruitful works are incapable of producing anything that God accepts or desires. Now, as you know, Jesus taught the seriousness of unfruitfulness. He applied it to people. He said, if any man in me does not bear fruit, the Father will remove them. And they'll be burned in the trash heap of humanity. That's what he said. The fruit we're talking about is Godward. Yeah. There are some things God can't get anything out of it. They're unfruitful works. Unfruitful works of darkness. There are some like philanthropic works that God can't get anything out of it. Because yes. his enemies are in the project. So he can't get any work out of it. Yeah, it's a reminder of that. The ones that, that came to help Nehemiah and then rebuild the walls. Yes, right. You have no part in yes, this. That's exactly right. So that, it, it's of that same nature. That's right. And Jesus also said, "You'll know them by their fruit." When he was talking about that's right. religious, he was talking about religious people. That's there, right. False teachers. Amen. You'll know them by their fruits. By their fruits. So this fruit thing is a, is a key. So there's some things, whether it's religious people or irreligious people. That's right. There's some people that can't give God anything. And there's some works that can't yield any benefit to God or what he's doing. Yeah. Whenever, um, whenever the possessed, the, the, the demons and the oh, possessed yeah. man would, wanted to say who Jesus was, he, he just shut it down. Yes. I, I yeah, won't even receive it yeah. from them because That's they right. were unclean. That's, That's mm -hmm. right. Now, this goes on to talk about light. What light does is it divides, yeah. it makes a division, a perceptible division between what's evil and what's good. So to accept something that might be construed as a good work from an evil source is to conflict and to yeah. confuse yeah. and to mingle. Where, and that's not what God's doing. He's dividing. He's separating. He's keeping the clean and the unclean. That's mm -hmm. what the priests were supposed to do. Yes. They were supposed to teach the people the yes. difference Amen. between what was holy and what was profane. Mm -hmm. And whenever you start letting wickedness take on the appearance of goodness, yep. then that distinction is lost. Amen. Yes. Now, because people under the law had not, they didn't have the mind of Christ, he transferred this distinction 
to foods and things like this. Like they come to a priest, they catch a fish. They might not have a well, understanding. They have to have scales, you know. It, it can't be a bottom feeder. And they say, can I eat this? He says, oh, you, you, you can't eat that. So here's an animal I got went honey, no, <laughs> no, that animal burrows under the ground. You no, you can't eat that. So they taught you taught them with like babies. Now that we're in Christ, yes. we don't have the distinctions now have been transferred to other to other matters that have a deeper bearing on humanity. But he yes. he taught people that God has a right to say you can do that and you can't do this. Amen. God has a right. God has a right to say, that's not right, this is right. See? And then, this is one of the great advantages of teaching your children properly. They grow up with, they know what's right and wrong. And that's essential, yes. Yeah, these things that he's talking about now, will they'll, they'll not only alter your, your body, they'll alter your character. Oh. So see these things yes. they have to be you have to come to a knowledge that they're yeah. wrong to before you can you cannot be involved in them but the Holy Spirit is inclined to open yeah. these things up to show you but as soon as it is it's your business to make sure you don't become uh, have fellowship with them. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, brother, this, yes, this is something I appeal to the young people at, at Juvie about because many of them have no concept yeah. of biblical understanding and so forth. I said this to them today, if, if, if we don't receive this standard of righteousness from God, who are you going to receive it from? Where, what source are you going to have? That's right. You're just blowing in the wind. That's you know, right. tossed here and there. Your idea is as good as mine, as good as so-and-so's, as good as this guy, and so forth and so on. The guy that talks the fastest, the guy that uses the biggest words, we're going to listen to him. Yes. The guy with the most money, we're going to listen to him. Well, there's plenty of human history about things like that and the fallacy yeah. of things like that. Who are you going to listen to anyway? Amen. Well, God has given us the standard. Amen. It's of Himself. Amen. Amen. Brother That's the wonderful thing about it. See, you can't legislate these kind of things, but God has put it in each person. That's right. That's what's profitable for me or not. That's now, right. And that chapter you referred to when uh, Jesus talks about if, you know, if you're not productive on the vine, so to speak, if you're not productive me. Now, what made that person unproductive was they 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 made decisions in their own life uh, that was unprofitable. That's right. So it, it translated, and them not being uh, not being able to produce for God. So they, Amen. they were not profitable in their decision. It's just this what I'm doing. Is it is this hindering me in the kingdom of God? As you got that's, that's right. the first thing you got to ask Amen. yourself. And we could uh, we could even elaborate some on that. Something that's not profitable is where you, you don't derive strength from Christ to do it. Yeah, some things, it's obvious to you, well, Jesus isn't going to support this. I mean, if, if I want to be a smart thief, I mean, I, Jesus isn't going to support that. But you've got to be able to decide whether you can call on the Lord to assist you in what you're doing or not. Because that's the one, the, the branch that didn't bear fruit wasn't, deriving strength from the vine that was the, what the problem was so this is this is unfruitful works of darkness are works that don't rely on Christ they're, they're activities that don't depend on God's strength and his wisdom that comes from him and strength that comes from Christ see that's the kind of works they are <laughs> and there were the unfruitful works of darkness that is darkness is the environment or soil where these works grow. Darkness in this case is to these works like the soil is to plants. That there's when a darkness in scripture you understand is ignorance. It's not knowing. It's living in the dark. We don't understand. Now there's certain things that grow in that kind of environment. Good plants don't grow in that environment. They grow in the light. They don't grow in that environment. The unfruitful works of darkness are works that the darkness actually has been the environment in which they've been produced. It's their ignorance of God that makes them do what they do. Yes. Well, see, it's a, kind of a far-reaching thing. Yeah. Sometimes we're, uh, we'll be tempted to be a little bit naive about why people are spiritually... I was about to say stupid, but spiritually ignorant. 
and we'll be a little too lenient. See, when people are spiritually ignorant, when they don't know God, and they don't know the truth, the works that we've been saying abstain from, they, this is the kind of environment in which they grow. Yes. They are works of darkness. Now, does that not put a different slant on know the Lord? Yes. See, when you know the Lord, this moves you out of this environment of darkness where everything that God doesn't accept grows. So when you get out of there, that's the secret. Amen. Go ahead. It's, it's one thing for a person to be be bothered or be shameful when they commit sin. It's another for a person like Paul who's bothered because he has the capacity oh, to sin. That's, that's what good. he meant in Romans 7 when he said, wretched yeah. man that I am. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. didn't mean I'm wretched when I when I commit yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. He meant wretched man that I am, that I have the capacity yeah. to, right. to, to sin. Mm -hmm. and even There's even a condition where men can just drink iniquity like water, like water and it doesn't bother them. That's like yes. the worst. Yes. But it's not, uh, regeneration doesn't just make a person that feels shameful when they commit sin. It yeah. makes a person that is yeah. that is shameful of their sinful nature. It's good. They're yes. bothered by the presence of their sinful it's, nature. Yes. And that's, that's, that's right. what enables a person to have no fellowship with the group of the darkness. Amen. This is not just uh, like an accelerated rule key. Amen. You, Amen. You know, there is a, a view of the new covenant as just like accelerated law keeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That we just we just have to do better than mm -hmm. what they did under yeah. the law and yeah. work harder and things. Yeah. And it's it's not just it's it's a change of nature. Amen. The law is for the lawless. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, when that man yes. receives a promise that he's going to receive a body like unto his glorious yeah, body. Yeah, that's good news. Now, that's old. Yeah. I'll give all yeah. diligence to make my glory. Amen. Amen. Sure. Amen. Amen. Yes. That's right. Now, see, it's wonderful to be among a people who know this, able to talk about it. It does, doesn't it do something for you? Because you, you, you are here, you've been talking, you've already, you've already come to that conclusion. Yeah. In yourself, and it, it's like he's saying amen to what you, amen. <laughs> to what you already thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to know that what, what the apostle Paul was grieving over there in Romans seven. Yeah. <laughs> the the things that people do often do didn't even come into his mind, and yet he was grieving <laughs> That's uh, right. over his capacity. That's right. And, and, and maybe some that he could be tempted. Yes, yes. Yeah. He greeted, it, but the things that a lot of people are engaged in, he never even thought about. Yeah, he was not tempted by those things. It even was like, before, even before. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was yeah. like the master. Well, he couldn't be tempted with some ordinary <laughs> right. gutter thing. You know, it had to be something really big. That's right. To be a real temptation to Jesus. It, Satan has never tempted me to turn a stone into bread. Yeah. Yeah. This also shows this uh, saying, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, shows that if you are ignorant, it's not an accident. That's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you, that's won't be, you won't be acquitted on the final day for being ignorant. Yeah, because God's made known. Right. See, there's, there's, no, there's no valid excuse to yeah. be ignorant now. Yeah. Yeah. And if a person, what about when you're a new believer? Well, a new believer, he's coming, he's coming out of the ignorance yeah. bit by bit, see? Uh -huh. So we're not talking about that kind of situation yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, I was considering um, kind of off what Mr. Moulton said about having no fellowship. Um, it's like if um, there's a person who um, needs to cut up some firewood and someone advises him you need to make sure you do this in the daytime, that way you don't hurt yourself, but they decide that they'll do it in the nighttime when it's dark and they can't see. <laughs> Yeah. And so they end up cutting themselves, and they have to go to the emergency room and get it fixed, and it immediately becomes unfruitful because then they don't have the wood that yeah. they need to burn that fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the unfruitfulness extended on further than just that nice work, didn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, if we're not, if we can't fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, well, let me say that another way. If we ought not to fellowship with the fruit, unfruitful works of darkness, it's just for the sake because they're not fruitful. It's, that's reason enough. What should we do then? Ignore them? No, no. Rather reprove them. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Rather reprove them. It's like trying to flash, like, thump. Show them for what it is. Some other versions read, expose them. 
or make their true quality clear or show them up for what they are or rebuke them or let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove and convict them. Now this is great ministry right here. I will tell you that people that are reproved or rebuked won't, will not always tell you I was really reproved and rebuked by what you said. But <laughs> that doesn't mean they weren't at all. So don't, don't value a person's response by you exposing. You're doing it for a couple of reasons. You're exposing it, shining the light on it for the sake of the person sin and for the sake of those others around who see it, Amen. that they'll not be snared by it. Amen. On this matter, now this is what I was told at a group meeting in Germany. It was like it was like the pre uh, promise keepers kind of thing. <laughs> and this man told me, he said, now what you don't want to do is if somebody believes something that you don't see it the same way, you don't want to say anything about that. The yeah. all we're gonna do is lift up Christ. Yeah. And this, you don't want to say anything negative. Yeah. We don't, none of this reproving stuff. Yeah. Because he says that will cause division. Here you are. And so none of that. So it's just lift up Christ. But see what you just said, that is lifting up. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Rather expose yeah. him. There's a sense in which we stand up for the truth just for the sake of the truth. Yeah. For the sake of the truth. Yeah. That's right. What, yeah. what John uses that yes. for the truth's yeah. sake. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever he uses that yeah. phrase. Yeah. Because he is the tr way, the Amen. truth. He is the way, the truth, and life. <laughs> the truth comes from God. And you're standing up for the truth. You're standing up for God. Amen. Mm -hmm. The witness. Amen. At the beginning of the creation of the world, God Himself did divide the light from the darkness. That's right. Yes. That's right. Amen. 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 One of the very first things He did. Yes. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Reprove them. Now the word reprove. I'll give you a technical definition of it: to convict or refute or confute. With the, generally with the suggestion of shame of the person convicted by conviction to bring to light, to expose, to find fault with, correct by word, to reprehend severely, chide, admonish, reprove. So it's a, it's a strong, it's a strong word. I mean, this is one of those works that is not enjoyable, right, right frankly. Sometimes you never want to get to the point where you like reproving somebody. <laughs> and that's, that's not good. It's not pleasant for you, but it's a necessity. Amen. Would, somebody like Apollos. Yeah. When you hear it, you embrace it. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was also thinking about that too, because at one point we had our works in darkness and when when they were exposed and reproved that's what enabled us to depart yeah. from them mm -hmm. and so um, i was thinking of the scripture that says what fruit had you then in those things where you are now no ashamed, ashamed. Mm -hmm. so if you're now ashamed of those things and that gives you the motivation to be able to expose these things for the others to be delivered as well yeah, yeah now let's let's take a moment and give a give an example of some works of darkness that were exposed Here's Peter in the day of Pentecost, and the people that crucified Jesus is, are there. So he says, you, to the hands of lawless men, have crucified and saved. And he exposed their deed. Yeah, right. uh -huh. See? And like Apollos, the people received it. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. yeah. He wasn't in darkness willingly. Oh, no. He had a heart for God. That's right. He just didn't have an understanding of it. That's right. His wasn't a work of darkness. No. It was a more of a no, novice, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, that on Pentecost, that what a classic example that is of he shined. They thought they were doing the work of God in getting rid of Christ. He shined the light on that, said, No, oh, this was you were not. You did what God determined, but you should not have done what you did. You have crucified the Lord of glory. That's what you've done. And they were convicted because of it. <laughs> See that's reproving. That's that's what it is. It's injecting light into the situation. Yes, yes. Yes. And by contrast, the darkness is is seen for what it is. Yeah. And uh, men may love darkness because their deeds are evil, but they can't really justify darkness. Yeah. So some people have likened it to this: that you take the deed, you drag it into the light. Some people, and, and I can kind of see this, they take, they take, 
you're bringing it, you're showing them from your, from the perspective of a ch children of light, you're showing them what the deed is, see? So in a sense, you're not going into the darkness to expose it. You're, you're bringing this out of putting it under the light. Say, this is what, this is what this is. What you did, Jews, was murder. Yeah. That's what Jesus did to the scribes in the first That's chapter right. of Matthew 23. That's right. He, Woe but, to you. He shined the light on their deeds, mm -hmm. see? Yeah. Expose them. Well, yes. See now, oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. But people can't be so simple as to think that reproving something doesn't involve their own uh, I mean we enter into this darkness is offensive to us Amen. in areas where we Amen. have been brought into the light and we see these things then darkness we are obnoxious by it Amen. so there, there is a very personal element to this it's not like, oh, I see the light and I'm supposed to do this now. I really hate doing this, but I will. No, we do it because we, when we've seen the light, we hold fast to the light and we reject the darkness. Mm -hmm. All right, then there's the facet where we do it because we would that other men be brought out That's of the right. same right. darkness That's and be right. delivered. Who would say that when Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, mm -hmm. that he was that he was against Peter. Mm -hmm. He wasn't against Peter, mm -hmm. but he was very obnoxious by the suggestion. That's right. That's right. And he he made it clear what was going on. Yeah. That delivered Peter. Yes. It, may, it but you see his own character as it's confronted with darkness Amen. and everything. How that the response is there. Amen. 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 Yeah. At the point that the light uh, makes manifest or reveals what the thing really is. Now, technically, the, the person, it, it's, like, it's like heaven's looking out to the reaction of the person. <laughs> is he ashamed? Yeah. Is he? Or can he not even blush? He's gone so far yeah. that he's there not one bit ashamed. There you go. And at that moment, the shame can, if shame can come, now grace will be given That's so right. they can repent. That's right. The oil, oil, That's mollifying right. ointment. Amen. Call for the mollifying ointment. That's right. <laughs> and this helps, um, like you, when you were talking about, there, there are babes in Christ that, that they're not, they're, not knowledgeable because yeah. they're babes, they're not but I'm thinking yeah. about they're, I'm thinking about children too. Um, this is how you help ones to grow up in Christ Amen. by doing these things, and, and it's a wise thing to do this with your children as you're raising them to to expose these deeds Amen. as they uh, apply to God, Amen. so that they can understand and they can Amen. they can really reason on the things of God at a young age, and then grow up thinking Amen. that way. Yeah, that, that's why I remember the Jewish people, God told them, speak about these to your children. Tell them when you go to bed, tell them when you get up. That's, that's what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. Now, light <coughs> is not limited to the influence of a person's life. I'm going to develop this a little bit later. The, the Word of God is called light also. In other words, we're going to deal with the let your light shine. Like, what, what exactly does that mean? When it says expose them, does that mean your godly life will expose their wrongness? So we'll, we'll speak about that. The prophetic gospel is called a light. Take heed unto the take heed unto the light till the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. So at this point I'm showing that the word of God is connected with light. It's not just the influence of a person. <coughs> Expose them for it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret. See, that sounds almost like a contradiction. You know, expose them, and you think you'd have to address the subject of what they're doing, but it's a shame to speak of those things. Shameful and disgraceful. Shame, that's a kind of an obsolete word in our day. I'm surprised the dictionary doesn't say uh, uh, obsolete or archaic, because shame, this is like in our society. The glory in their shame. The glory in their shame, that's right. Something that's shameful is base or dishonoring, 
brings dishonor upon a person. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were ashamed right, before God. <laughs> when a man named Hanan took Sir David's servants and shaved off one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to the buttocks, and sent them away, it said they were greatly ashamed. Knowing that the Lord had promised to be with him as they were coming out of Babylon, Ezra said he was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help him. <laughs> They're coming from Babylon, going back to Jerusalem, but his enemies along the way, and Ezra was ashamed to ask for a military uh, group to go along with an escort <laughs> because God had said he'd be with them. See that? How's that for sensitivity? Yeah, the people have got to get to the point where they're ashamed to ask the world for help. And things pertaining to God we're talking about. Ashamed. And then again, when Ezra's praying to the Lord after it, the people are being restored, he said, Oh my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass has grown up into heaven. Now, Ezra himself hadn't sinned, but the people with whom he's identified had. All right, what, what would happen, you suppose? If, whether it's a congregation or a whole denomination or whatever, somebody stood up and said, Lord, we're ashamed, we're blessed to lift up our face to you about what's happened yes. to your church. The per, per, I'm part of the thing, and look what's happened. I'm ashamed and blessed to lift up my face. I mean, I have an idea a lot of the things would change. That God would work if somebody. This is what Daniel did. Remember, Brother Gene mentions Daniel often. He, he would confess the sins that happened a long time before him. See, and the situation we're in is caused by some sins way back. It's not wrong to just acknowledge it before God. You know, I'm ashamed that this happened in my generation, Lord. I'm ashamed this happened. Amen. And I think God hears, Amen. hears prayers like that. And then as someone had already mentioned that he mentions our former sins whereof we are now ashamed. Shamed. I'm glad that we don't have to rehearse each other's past every time we come together. Isn't that a great deliverance? Yeah, a lot of times Israel, they had to do that. Every time they got together, some prophet spoke, he'd have to rehearse <laughs> the sins of the people. Stephen, he had to rehearse. Paul rehearsed Israel's sin, see that prophecy rehearsed what the people did that was sinful. When you come into Christ, you don't have to do that anymore, praise God. Now we can rehearse what the Lord has done. You see, see the difference? Yeah, some of Jeremiah spoke of, of people who couldn't blush. All of this blush, shame, ashamed, this has a strange sound in the mega church entertainment type environment. This is strange language. But you won't in scripture there's a certain modesty when sin is addressed, there's a certain modesty to it. It's not raw, rough type language. For instance, when uh, in idolatry there were some atrocities committed that are never detailed in scripture. Terrible, terrible things. You have to read history books, and it's appalling, you know. But actually, you should, we shouldn't do it. But it's appalling to read. Some of them would, would offer, burn their children, and a Molech had hands hanging on. They'd lay their children on the fire and offer their children to God. But in speaking of it, Leviticus 18.21 said, They caused their seed to pass through the fire. See how, see how modest that is? It doesn't awaken like things that just almost make you faint for awfulness. There's general terms like rioting, see? <laughs> now, the details of rioting, it's just best, it's best not to go into that, see? These are works of darkness. It's a shame, but it's not because you know the details. See, what I'm showing here is, in Christ, there's a certain kind of sensitivity that you're just ashamed to talk about certain things. 
And another word is chambering. It's lewdness, but it's has to do with immorality. Here's another revelings or abusers of themselves. See, there are, there are the type of words that you have to think about, but you're thinking about it from a different perspective than the details. Yeah. If the, all of the details of immorality was laid out on the table, it'd have a defiling effect on your mind and your conscience and everything else. So there's certain large words that are big enough that you don't, if you just think about them, you don't think of the sordid details. Now this is one of the bad effects of modern entertainment where people now visually see things that were withheld from people before. And you know that there are, you can't like get it out of your mind right away. When I was a boy, young man, this issue came up in Hollywood. Any kind of a scene that had to do a bed was there, the man had to have one foot on the floor. This was a standard Hollywood <laughs> procedure. And it could be no nakedness to the waist up or any of this, this th these were rules. When this began to be changed, it caused a lot of alarm and a generation that's produced is a generation that's more free than they ought to be. They know more than they ought to know. They're tempted in areas they didn't have to be tempted in. That's why this modest language is employed. It's a shame even to speak of those things. Not to let them come out of your mouth. But not speaking of them is a way in which we remain clean of them. That's good. Amen. That's good. Amen. <coughs> yes, I can see if you speak about them, the reality of them become has more access to you. Well, there's a there's a natural embarrassment in yeah. people yeah. on certain things. And so when you break down those walls of embarrassment, mm -hmm. well then you're more apt to to actually engage in the That's activity. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're ashamed to speak of it, the chances of you doing it are, are Amen. greatly reduced. Yes. Shame even to speak of those things. This is good in it teaching your children and so forth. There's just certain words that just, you just don't use. That are common words that people, other kids use, children use. No, They're because they wake up things that you don't want woke up. <laughs> Shame to speak of them. Also, there I hear words at work and I don't want to do any of the yeah. things that they're talking about, but they disgust me. Oh, yeah. And there's a, it's kind of like getting dirty. That's you, right. I mean, and it's, it, you don't mow it over in your head, but it, it is. It, it's just like you don't even want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. That's right. And that takes time. See, that's, this takes, this is like a robber. It's like a robber of your time. You'd rather spend your time on something productive, but now you've got to do it to fight off this, these, uh, fend off these temptations. <clears throat> now they're done, he says, uh, in secret. Now there's a marked tendency of people who commit reprehensible sins, they like to have a dark. Like you'll never see a bar with a lot of lights. Is some of the bars that are downtown, you drive by them, you know, it looks like they're closed, but they're not. <laughs> Nightclubs, dark. There's something about it, darkness. It's that man naturally wants to, things done in secret. And these are things that are done purely out of self-interest and self-pleasure. That's the only reason they're done. And there's a sense, there's a sense of shame that unfortunately is being destroyed in our day, but there's a sense of shame that accompanies it, just shamed of such a things. This idea of awakening things. Illustrated to me, I received news yesterday about three boys 
in broad daylight walked into an apartment over here in Joplin, nine and ten year old boys with a resident at home, and just started walking around the apartment picking up things, putting them in their pockets, and they were going to walk out with them. Nine and ten year old boys. Where'd they get the idea? Something like yeah. that. In right in front of the resident. It was planted in them. That's right. Somehow. That's right. I know children have always taken things and so forth, but this is right in front of them and thought that they could just brazenly yeah. walk right out. That's part of what we're talking about. Yes. See, that's fruit. See, that's mm -hmm. unfruitful. Yes. It's not that it has no fruit. It doesn't even fruit Godward, but it does have this fruit on the ungodliness. Yeah. yeah. The impact on um, these words of darkness uh, on anyone's mind is, is really beyond... Um, Total comprehension by us. He, he, Satan said, "Thou shalt not surely die," and the repercussions of that. Oh yeah. See that, yeah. that, that, that he introduced something in her mind that had never been yeah. there before. Amen. And so when this when this occurs, the, this people do not have full control of their minds. They think they do. They say things like, "I I can do whatever. I can quit whatever I want. When yeah. I I can do whatever." No, you can't. Yep. You have to go to sleep at some time, mm -hmm. and when you do, you don't have control yeah, of your you're mind. You're vulnerable. Right. And all of a sudden, everything you've exposed yourself to is available to your mind to create whatever it wants to create. Mm -hmm. And what you put in there, it will, it'll use it. Well, yeah. And at least, you know, you, you, we've all experienced this. You're trying to study, you're trying to think about the things of God, and something enters your mind. Yeah. What happened? And mind doesn't, there's a sense in which you can't stop what comes into it. I mean, in the thought That's world. right. But as far as what you put in it yourself, you do have that. Yes, you can amen. Stop things. Amen. <clears throat> now Jesus said that there's going to there's coming a day, a point of day when everything done in secret will be made known. Whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. That which ye have spoken in the ear, in closets, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And again, he said nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest. Oh. <laughs> you want to get rid of those things on, by the blood of Christ. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. right. You can see if your wife, if he forgives you your trespasses and washes them away, then you know this expose here, you'll be free from that. But see, the thought, the thought of this, with some people I unfortunately know, I dread to even think about. I just know a few things they did and it repels me. I can only can imagine when they're all yeah. made known. So it's a shame to talk about those things. You know then, um, the advent of entertainment, they not only will talk about some of these things, they'll entertain you by the display of some of these things. He had no idea the yeah. repercussions of the things he involved himself in. That's right. But he thought he was just like exercising him to be able to, to taste of everything. Remember he said he gave himself to everything, to yeah. experience everything. But he didn't realize the end of that. That's right. The end of that, remember, it took his heart away. Yeah, he married heathen women so yeah. he could merge with other nations, you know. That, that, that's not all that happened. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, here's an explanatory statement. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So when he says expose or reprove, it means whether it's by life or deed, light is shined on the subject. It illuminates it. Shows it as it really is, in other words. So he's going to develop this... Uh, Reproof or rebuke of the works of darkness by associating reproof with light. Holy light, mm -hmm. we're talking about. This is a light that shines forth from the manner of a person's life and from the words they speak. Yeah, that's right. It's like a two pronged thing. Light is not confined to wordless influence. Jesus affirmed, I am the light of the world, but it didn't speak about his influence until his ministry began. And as soon as he started speaking, the scripture says a great light was seen. See, it, so it wasn't just that he walked among men and said, oh, look at him. Boy, oh, I feel bad that I'm not as good as him. That's not how it was when he began speaking. 
That's when the light came. See, it's the profession of one's faith or the giving of an answer for the hope that's within you or the word of your testimony. Yeah. That is like a light yeah. that's shining. I get the impression that the people in Nazareth were impressed by what they heard of what he'd done. Yeah. But when he came and spoke to them, that's they right. weren't impressed. That's okay. right. the great, that was a they, greater light. Yeah, they wanted to. Yeah, they wanted to get rid of him. They didn't want him there. They didn't want to hear it. Mm. Yeah, he mentions all things that are reproved. I said to reprove them, but it, some things aren't reproved because people are recalcitrant in this area. But all things that are reproved. His deeds and manners, they are reproved, they are exposed, they are made clear what they really are. It's the category again of things that nothing good or profitable can come from them. But that light's been shown on it. It's been cleared up, made more, that people see these things differently. That even though they look, you can learn a lot if you do this, you can get a lot if you do this. No, you can't get a lot if you do this. These are unfruitful yes. yeah. works of darkness. They're made manifest by the light. <clears throat> Other versions read exposed by the light or made clear by the light. He exposes the true character of everything. They're made evident. See, the, the light is traced back to as a person Christ, is the is as a person. The gospel is the next media, and then those that are in Christ are the next means through which the light is channeled. These deeds of darkness contrast with the light. When the light shone, <coughs> these things don't reflect light. See, there's so, actually you can really only see things that reflect light as I understand it. But the deeds of darkness, they have to be exposed. They, they don't respond to the light. Like you can take a legitimate object of some sort that's in the dark, you shine a light on it, and it, it brings, you can see it more clearly in the light. These words of dark, works of darkness can't be seen clearly unless it's in the spiritual illumination. It's shed on the subject. Now, it's necessary again to associate this with the Word of God, which is the light called a light, Psalm 119. Now the rule applies here was uttered to Israel. Here's what it was said to them. Yeah, Isaiah 8, 20. To the law and to the testimony. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. Okay. So it isn't just your your character, your influence, that exposes the. It's just I, I want to develop this here at this point a little bit. A generation, take for instance, that has not been exposed to the Word of God, has no way of deciphering what's right and what's wrong. If Jesus Christ himself stood before them and never said anything, they couldn't tell whether they were different from... Yeah, that's right. yeah. They have no means to judge it. They can't. In our generation, you could live a holy, absolutely holy life and people will conclude you're a nut. That's right. yes. They won't conclude you're godly because they don't know anything. They won't, they, this isn't in their mindset. See, so expose them has to do with this. This often a word has to be spoken about this. Now, this is why Jesus came to the Jewish people who were cultured to receive the Messiah. Every Sabbath, the scriptures and the prophets are read in their synagogues. They were a people that were scripturally literate. So now when they saw Christ, they could make an association. Some of them rejected it and some accepted it, but some ex they could make an association of Christ with what had been said. Believe me when I tell you that if you don't open your mouth to this generation, they're not going to know you're different. That's right. You'll just be looked at as a person who has different habits, 
maybe a little different likes, but they won't they won't connect it with God. See, this this light has to be connected with God. And in our generation, particularly, if there's no word, if you don't appeal to the scriptures, they have nothing to they have no knowledge that connects with God. On this you see. So when you have a combination of a society in general that is scripturally illiterate and you add to that a church that is scripturally unknowledgeable, you have virtually an impossible situation. You've got a generation that's going to be rejected. That's what you've got. Now in Israel's day, they had the scriptures, they were knowledgeable of the scriptures, but the people had allowed the scribes and the Pharisees and lawyers, Sadducees, to trump scripture with their traditions, and their traditions overshadowed the scripture so they didn't see who Jesus really was. Now you take someone like Nathaniel, Peter and John, John the Baptist, they they saw who Jesus really was. You see, you see how serious a situation we're in? Why, why we've got to be a scripture people. Not, not just a sense of legality. Now he makes this that last statement. Whatever doth make manifest is light. Now this is surprising, but I'll give you what some of the versions say. By the light, it becomes visible. That's good. Everything that becomes visible is light. Uh, that's not what it says. Everything that is made manifest is light. Kevin, I guess not, that's not what the text said, but these are, I'm reading from versions of Scripture here. Everything which is made clear is light. Everything that becomes visible is light. Anything illuminated is itself a light. Where everything is visible and clear, there is light. Now, that's good. All right, now this is a technical point. When the light falls on something, that something does not become light. These versions say it does. Just what is what is manifested is light. No, that's not what it says at all. And I'll tell you why. Because that would require transformation. And if you let your light shine, the light that shines from you does not have transforming power. It does not. Any power that is through Christ is the light. See, this is a very serious mistranslation. Very serious. Whatever is made manifest is light. And if, what they, if they were said is enlightened, it wouldn't even be right. But the point is that light is what makes the thing known. Or think of light as revelation. It comes from God. That's what, that's what makes a thing known. Your person doesn't make a thing known. Unless the person who sees you has some intelligent idea about God and the people of God and so forth, then that's another, that's another matter. So what happens when you speak your war, the word that sheds light on the subject, then the people are able to connect what you said, not only with them, but with your own, with your own manner. Otherwise, you could say, let there be light and there would be light. That's right. So, I mean, God can say that and there would, there's light because he has right. the power in himself. That's right. So you have, a, like you've already said this, you have a reflective quality. Christ is in you. So, but see, this is not the same as Christ when he walked on the earth working miracles. Otherwise, you could just you could do the that's same right. thing, yep. but you can't. What you can do, see, the, yeah. what what illuminates what the light that's been given you is to illuminate your path, and as you walk in the Spirit and live unto the Lord, you will be noticeable. Your light will shine. Yeah. But that light 
if at best brings an opportunity for change in others, it's not right. the change itself. And, then, and even then, it's only to the degree that they're able to recognize its light. If they're Athenians, and they hear Paul preach about the resurrection, they don't say, whoa, I, we see that clearly. Yeah, that's right. See, I'm saying that this, people glibly say, just let your light shine, just live out there godly. Well, you should live godly, make no mistake about it. But that isn't going to change anybody, particularly when society has no idea about why you're different. Yeah. They think it's just a matter of your discipline, that you've chosen a different kind of lifestyle. Has been said, if the light that is in you is darkness, yeah, how great, great is the darkness? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I, I like the the version that says, "Whatsoever makes manifest, that's what light is." So, if the things, if people see the thing as it really is, somebody shine the light. <laughs> right? there, there's been some light. It isn't in their intellect they figured it out. Someone shined the light on this thing, which means it was seen from heaven's perspective. Yeah, yeah. There is no light in the earth. It's got to come from something. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I'll, I'll close there. This, uh, this to me was a very uh, challenging text of Scripture, not because it was like intellectually difficult, because uh, you can see the, what I might call the ramifications of Scripture, that God works in an environment where there's, where there's light. Mm -hmm. And where there isn't light, darkness, certain things are worked mm -hmm. in darkness. But it's the obligation of people mm -hmm. or in Christ to make sure nobody around them mm -hmm. is ignorant mm -hmm. about these deeds of darkness. Shine the light on them. Any of you have a... Uh, yes, Sister Tasha. Yeah, this, this last point that you were talking about reminded of the Ethiopian eunuch. At some point, there had to have been light right. that shined That's right. it to him in order that he would be able to receive the That's gospel right. that was preached by Philip. If there hadn't been any of this, he, would not, he wouldn't even have had any inclination to even yeah. read the passage in Isaiah that that eventually Philip was able to expound and bring bring him to the Lord. Amen. See, this, is a, this is a great ministry everybody has in your circle of influence. You have to shed light on, on things. And the more people know about the Word, your life then will, will testify also, you see. But it's a great ministry that everybody has. No one's excluded from it. And you can uh, participate in the grand work of exposing the works of darkness. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else tonight? Yes, Brother Aaron. This message from Brother Jeremy just a few minutes ago. So John Paul has made a drastic change very quickly for the better. He remains in ICU for now. It looks like he has third degree burns from head to toe. Tell the brother and the Lord heard the prayers of his people. Amen. Praise God, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a pity the way to conclude the day. <laughs> oh. See now, there's another case. Here's a, here's a man and his family who recognized and could report the work of God. Some people would have seen the same thing and wouldn't be able to make the association. Yeah, wonderful. We'll have a word of prayer. As we have any Father, we're grateful. For the light, and we we thank thee for giving us a ministry of exposing the deeds of the unfruitful works of darkness. Grant us grace to do this faithfully and in a proper disposition of mind, heart, and mind. That uh, to be ministers of disposing of ignorance every place we can, and to contribute to the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.